The Life of the Great Martyr Christopher The handsome soldier who prayed to God to make him ugly because his looks were a cause of temptation, whose memory the Holy Church commemorates on May 9th. Saint Christopher, the glorious great martyr of Christ, was born in the city of Toledo, Spain. He was born, as it is recorded by several authors of his life, to wealthy noble citizens of that city, and at his birth was named Reprebus. Although Saint Christopher would become one of Christianity's greatest saints, his parents were of the lineage of the Canaanese, or man-eaters. This title does not imply that they were from Canaan, or that they were cannibals, or as some foolish authors have implied that they were part canine, but rather that they were pagans, who offered up humans as sacrifices to the pagan gods. Reprebus lived during the reign of Emperor Decius, 249-251 through 251 AD, who systematically organized and authorized a persecution of Christians, which had at its primary goal the restoration of the pagan religions and institutions of ancient Rome. Raised in a dark and perverse culture where wealth, luxury, and power, as well as courage and physical strength, were the most desired attributes, Reprebus excelled in the acquisition of these qualities. He grew into another Hercules, a man of handsome appearance and great strength and stature. He was greatly admired by many in this pagan world, especially by women whose admiration he greatly desired. But more than this, he wished to serve and obey the most powerful ruler in all the world, the Emperor Decius, from whom he hoped to attain greater wealth, power, and fame. All the world feared Decius and his infamous Roman legion. It came into Reprebus' mind that he should become a great warrior of the Roman legion. He progressed so quickly as a Roman legionnaire that in a short time, Reprebus had gained great fame and honors from the emperor. He was not a proud or boastful man, but a meek and humble one. His fellow soldiers respected him very much and were amazed at how he was able to combine great fame and power with such humility and meekness. It happened one day that as Reprebus was walking and conversing with the emperor, he noticed that the emperor shrunk in fright at the mention of the devil. Reprebus contemplated within himself that if the emperor, whom all the world feared, was afraid of the devil, the devil must be more powerful than the emperor himself. He therefore decided to become a servant of Satan. Finding Satan, he entered into his service. Once Reprebus had not gone far on a certain road, when he noticed that the demon with whom he was traveling took a long detour in order to avoid a cross near the roadside, the demon explained his fear thus, There was a man called Christ who was hanged upon the cross, and when I see his sign I flee from it as from fire. Reprebus replied, if only the sign is a source of fright and pain for you, then surely he must have greater power than you. Him, then, will I seek and serve. As he went this way into the desert places of Egypt, where his legion was stationed at the time, Reprebus was blessed by God, who knows the hearts of men, to meet a Christian hermit. This hermit told him about Christ and Christianity. He also told him that if he desired to meet Christ, he would have to become a Christian. In order to become a Christian, he would have to do one of two things, either to fast strictly or to pray continually. Reprebus declared that in order to maintain his great strength, he would not be able to fast, and also that he was unable to pray continually. The hermit then told him that if he could not fast or pray, he would have to go to a broad and rapid river where many were known to perish in their attempt to cross over, and he must help those who wished to get to the other side. Reprebus went to this mighty river and settled there in a small shelter which he made for himself. Daily he carried over as many people as wished to cross, holding a wooden staff in his hand, which he used in passing through the turbulent waters. He bore all manner of people all day long, without stopping to rest. One night as he slept, he heard a child's voice cry out to him, Reprebus, come out and bear me over. He awoke and went outside, but found no one. He re-entered his house and again heard the same voice, Reprebus, come out and bear me over. He ran out but again found no one. Frustrated, he again entered his shelter and a third time, Reprebus, come out and bear me over, was heard. However, this time, he did indeed find a child at the river's edge. The child asked him kindly to carry him across the river. Reprebus placed the child on his shoulders and taking his staff entered into the water in an attempt 
to across the river. Suddenly, the rapids became stronger and the water began to rise and swelled more and more as he continued, and the child grew heavy on his shoulders. As the water became more turbulent and the child burdened him as a lead weight, Reprebus felt great anguish, fearing that they would surely drown at any moment. Finally, after a painful struggle, he escaped the waters and set the child on safe ground. He then exclaimed to the child, Child, you have put me in great peril. You weighed me down as though I had all the world upon my shoulders. I cannot bear any greater burden. The child answered, Christopher, marvel at nothing, for you have not only carried all the world upon your shoulders, but you have carried him who created the world and all that is in it. I am Jesus Christ the King, whom you seek, and for whom you serve in this work, and that you may know that what I say is true. Set your staff in the earth by your house, and tomorrow you shall see that it shall bear flowers and fruit. The child Christ, having finished these words, suddenly disappeared before the eyes of Reprobus. Returning to his home, he set his staff in the ground, and in the morning arose to find his staff bearing flowers, leaves, and dates. Seeing this miracle, he decided to devote his entire life to Christ and to henceforth live a chaste life. Returning to life in the city, he quickly discovered that his handsome looks were more a cross than a blessing, a cross that was too heavy for him to bear. Pagan women were constantly at his door and would not leave him in peace. He began to pray fervently and to fast with the hope that by doing so the Lord would lift this heavy burden from him and would also grant him the divine and life-giving water of Christian baptism. He awoke one morning to the appearance of an angel who told him to take courage for the Lord was with him and would grant him his requests in due time. This vision proved to be a true one for he found that his handsome face had been transformed and was now disfigured, and his beautiful voice had become garbled in tone. He was overjoyed at these changes, comforted in the knowledge that the Lord was with him, for he had finally answered his request in such an unexpected way. He felt confident that the Lord would somehow grant his second request also, that of holy baptism. Those who had once praised and admired Reprebus for his looks now insulted him with slurs such as dog face and dog head and did all they could to avoid him. Paying no attention to their meanness, Reprebus went about the town admonishing those who persecuted Christians. He argued that there was no threat to the empire from people whose religion preached love, peace, and mercy for all mankind. He traveled throughout the Middle East to Egypt, Syria, Lycia, and Asia Minor, preaching as well as he could against the persecutors of the Christians. Hearing of Reprebus's labors on behalf of the Christians, the Emperor Decius was greatly angered and ordered his arrest. Two hundred soldiers, former comrades of Reprebus, were sent after him, and aware at his utterly hideous change in appearance, quickly found him. Though under arrest, the saint's only thought was to preach the truth of Christ to his old friends. He was abruptly halted, however, when the General Bacchus struck him in the face. The Holy One meekly replied that he would not strike him back, but would accept this abuse without offense in the name of Christ, who taught that one should forgive those who do you harm and do good to those who hate you. Since he was unable to speak very clearly, an angel was sent to him and touched him in the mouth, telling him to be manly and brave. Reprebus then clearly and strongly said to Bacchus that if he, Reprebus, were to get angry and use his strength against him, neither he nor the emperor could possibly defeat him. However, since he had converted to Christ, he would not resist him in any way and would be glad to die for Christ, the greatest of all kings. Standing before the general and his soldiers, the saint picked up a staff which previously had been dry and dead, but now in his hand sprouted flowers. All in the regiment were amazed at this miracle and would do him no harm, nor attempt to bind him. Running short on provisions after their search for reprobus, the soldiers asked the saint for help asking for a few pieces of their remaining bread. Reprebus prayed over them, and they were miraculously multiplied in such an abundance that there was now more than enough food for everyone. This miracle converted them all, including Bacchus. The soldiers decided to accompany the saint to Antioch in Syria, where St. Babylus, the bishop of that city, baptized them all. Having heard of the trials and tribulations of Reprebus and of his divine visitations, St. Babylus baptized Reprebus with the name of Christopher, Christophoros, which means the Christ-bearer. 
St. Christopher then begged his fellow Christians to take him to the emperor as they were commanded, lest they suffer the emperor's wrath and vengeance. With great sadness and reluctance, they returned to the emperor with their joyously willing captive. When the emperor, who assumed that St. Christopher had been captured after an exhaustive search, beheld the sight of him, he suddenly lost consciousness and fell to the ground. Finally coming to himself, the emperor asked the saint who he was. He replied, Before I was baptized, I was named Reprebus, and now I am Christopher. Before baptism, I was a Canaanite, now I am a Christian. The emperor then tried to forcibly and slyly convert St. Christopher back to idolatry. However, his attempts were in vain, for neither wealth, luxury, or power could induce the Holy One to give up his faith, hope, and love in Christ. Frustrated in his inability to bring the saint over to the worship of idols, the despot ordered two beautiful prostitutes sent to his prison cell to arouse his former passion and lust for women. These two women, named Kalinica and Aquilina, were commanded by Decius to seduce Christopher, causing him to renounce his faith in Christ in order to enjoy this sinful, lustful pleasure. The emperor promised great rewards to the women if they succeeded, but certain death if they failed to tempt the saint and lead him into sin and apostasy. The two women were led to the Holy One's cell, but in the face of this seductive temptation, St. Christopher not only remained fervent and unmoved in his faith, but indeed brought the women to repentance and tears, and finally conversion to Christ. With boldness and manly courage, Kalinica and Aquilina returned to Emperor Decius and declared that they themselves were now Christians and were ready to suffer any torment for the love of Christ. The emperor became furious at hearing their words and ordered the women to be immediately tortured and killed. The two endured various tortures but refused to renounce Christ. They reposed the same day, entering the kingdom of God at the eleventh hour. The emperor then ordered St. Christopher to be brought forward. At the sight of the saint's face, the emperor mocked him, but the Holy One only replied that the emperor was indeed worthy of the title, Servant of the Devil. In his fury, the emperor ordered the two hundred soldiers to torment St. Christopher, but to the emperor's surprise, they all declared that the God of Christopher was their God. They bowed towards St. Christopher and remained in that position, while at Decius's command, executioners came forward and beheaded them all, and then took their bodies to be burned. St. Christopher was then taken and welded into a brass iron cast vessel. This vessel was heated to a great temperature until it glowed bright red and steamed from the intense heat. However, to the amazement of all, the saint remained unharmed. He showed no sign of harm or suffering, but rather looked like one emerging from a cool bath. He explained to all that would listen that while he was locked in this vessel, he had a vision in which he saw a tall, handsome man, dressed in a white gown, shining as bright as the sun. He was wearing a brightly shining crown upon his head, and he stood surrounded by many angelic soldiers, who also shone brightly. These angelic soldiers were a battle with dark, foul, and horrid creatures who were trying to capture the saint. The bright and handsome figure had only to look with fury upon these dark ones, though, and in the awesome sight of his greatness, they hastily fled. St. Christopher added that the vision gave him greater strength and courage to endure the heat of the vessel. Although the emperor and many around him felt that this was all some kind of illusion or trick, many others were converted to Christianity, persuaded by the vision and the saint's miraculous endurance of torture. They rushed toward the vessel and released St. Christopher. After restoring order, Emperor Decius commanded all those who had assisted the saint to be executed by mutilation and beheading. A great stone was then tied around the neck of St. Christopher, and he was thrown into a deep well. But angels immediately came to his rescue and placed him unharmed before Decius. Finally, he was taken out and beheaded. A year later, Decius and his son suffered the same fate at the hands of the Gothic invaders. However, St. Christopher received reward for good, and Decius received eternal punishment for evil. Christians from Lycia are said to have brought the relics of St. Christopher to Dolodo, Spain, where they remained for over 500 years. They were then transferred to the safety of St. Denis in Paris, France during the invasion of the Moors into Spain. In the West, St. Christopher is recognized as a patron of travelers, and an intercessor in times of disaster, famine, and especially of plague. 
The Black Death was said to have suddenly ceased in Spain on his feast day. In icons, he is depicted carrying Christ upon his shoulder or with a grotesque face. However, he should not be depicted with the head of a dog, which some iconographers have done. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers and of St. Christopher and all the saints, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. A raid investor died with thine own blood. Thou standest before the King of hosts, O ever memorable Christopher. Therefore with the incorporeal ones, and the martyrs thou dost sing thrice holy and awesome melodies. Wherefore by thy supplications save thou thy flock. Thou wast terrifying both in might and countenance. Thou didst willingly suffer temptation from thy persecutors. Those men and women sought to arouse in thee the fire of lust, but they follow thee to martyrdom. Wherefore thou art our strong protector, O great martyr Christopher.